welcome to the Physiology of Sang and Sang and Sang um, and today we're having a little departure from our typical Physiology of Singing series to talk a little bit about, it's going to be kind of a little crossover essentially with a little bit of linguistics thrown in there. Which, total disclaimer, I am not a linguistics person, I do not have a single linguistics degree, I have a lot of friends who did linguistics in undergrad because a lot of people in speech language pathology come in through the linguistics side, but that was not me, so, uh, so I'm more going to be talking about it in terms of speech patterns and how that might affect the vowels you, you use for singing and just in general kind of learning diction because it's an important thing to know about as a singer and hopefully will help some singers unpack stuff when it gets really confusing in like diction classes if you're a voice major and you're learning your diction and then like you know you go to your like Italian class and you learn to say it one way and then you go to diction and the teacher's like, no, that's not how you sing it. Ah! And it just gets confusing, right? Um, been there, done that. Not as fun. So, <laughs> all right. So I talked a bit ago, there was another video I have on there about formants. So I would recommend watching that one first um, and going and getting some idea of what formants are. But... For quick review, formants are just um, peaks of energy in the harmonic spectrum. So high intensity. So essentially the vocal track, the filter, for you anyway. But, you know, heck, the trumpet shape, the muffler on your car, the whatever, whatever filter it is that's that's taking a vibration and, and uh, you know, kind of amplifying certain frequencies and dampening others. Uh, the filter has created the form and shape, meaning certain harmonics in the sound that your vocal folds are producing as a singer or as a brass player, the vibrations your lips are doing, or as a, you know, double reed instrument, it's the vibration of the reeds, right? Like all the stuff starts with vibration. So, um, yeah. And for strings as well, strings are just that vibration plus that plus the body of the instrument. Um, so, talking about taking that vibration source and filtering it through so that certain areas get increased, get kind of a boost, okay? And those are what we call the formants. Now, when we talk, you've probably heard a bit about vowel formants, and vowels have resonance. You might hear that a lot. I heard that a lot as a singer. Vowels have resonance, you know? They have resonance. Um, and it's true, they do. What they don't have is the singer's formant. The singer's formant is much higher than vowel formants. But what it means by vowels have, fre has re have resonances, it doesn't mean they have frequencies necessarily, per se. Um, there's not like a set frequency for what an E needs to be, like the, the, the first formant and the second formant. Those are the two we always talk about, first and second. First band of energy and the second band of energy for vowels, okay? And instead of it being specific frequencies, there is a frequency range that they occur in, but it's different. Men's are lower than women's. Kids are higher than adults, okay? So, which makes sense because so is the frequency they're putting out. So is like the size of the vocal tract is different across, um, you know, the different physiologies of like child to adult and all of that. So, um, <clears throat> so you end up with first and second formant and where they lay relative each other to each other within a certain band of frequencies. Okay. Um, gives you the perception of one vowel over another. This is kind of like vowel 101. So an E vowel, if you're doing an E, nice bright E, you end up with uh, first formants very low, second formants actually very high. It's the most spread out that the formants are. This is actually one of the reasons if someone has high frequency hearing loss, E vowels get really hard to hear, to distinguish, because that second formant's so high up that that might be right where they can't hear very well. Which is kind of funny, because then the E sounds like an OO, actually. We'll get to that in a second. But it is it seems counterintuitive, but it totally makes sense if you know the acoustic spectra. Okay? Um, and so that's one thing there. Now, you might hear this, where people relate it to tongue position, or to, like, throat versus mouth. 
you know, like pharyngeal resonance versus oral resonance giving you the vowel shapes. Not necessarily, but it is about where the tongue is contracting to narrow the airway in your vocal tract. That is what's giving you those differences. So when you do an E, a real E vowel, you have your tongue is humped up really high toward sort of your alveolar ridge, which is that bumpy ridge behind your upper teeth, your bone there. That is, um, it's sort of humped up way up there. You have a lot of closure in the front of your mouth. And then you, that means you have a lot of space behind that tongue, a huge space, everything from that constriction and the curve in your vocal tract, little tip singers, that curve doesn't matter. We could have a totally straight up and down vocal tract and we sound the same. The only thing, the curve, the thought of the curve is that it's biologically, like it makes it a lot easier to have like a 17 centimeter or 15 centimeter tube <laughs> in your body. <laughs> so um, basically we would look like very different humanoids if we just have a straight tube to a mouth. We'd also have our mouth hanging up at the top of our heads. It would just be, that would probably be rather awkward with like rain and stuff. So yeah, not the most practical design. Much more practical to have a little bend and just kind of have your mouth here. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> All right, so, so we don't worry about the bend, but we worry about where that tongue is constricting. So back to the E. So we have the E right there at that ridge. We got a lot of opening underneath where that tongue, like behind that hump in the tongue, it's all just open airspace back there. And then we have that really small opening up in the front of the mouth. Now, if you remember from the little bit of acoustics I did in that other video, um, smaller spaces are gonna resonate at higher frequencies, right? So that means that high second formant really relates anyway to, or somehow, you know, basically the small space in front of the hump tongue, the small mouth closure right there, that small space, it's gonna have to do with that really high second formant. And the first formant is low because you've got all this air space back here. You got a ton of air space back there. You've got a nice big tube back there that's gonna resonate at those lower frequencies and give those a boost. So you end up with small space here, big space back here. You get the separation of formants and then the listener goes, yes, that's a very good E. <laughs> good job, you did a pure E, basically. Um, for an ah, a lot of singers think an ah is a neutral vowel. It's actually not. I learned that as, you know, when I was in my classes, I was like, oh, what, ah is not neutral? Ah? No, schwa is neutral. Uh, uh is a neutral vocal tract position. That's like your tongue is just kind of hanging out. Uh, 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 we tend to say that a lot. Um, uh, okay, so a schwa sound is actually your neutral vocal tract for as far as where tongue constrictions are concerned. So an ah actually has a little bit of the tongue pulling back just a touch. So you have an, a lot of opening here, a decent amount of opening back there because the tongue's only pulling back a little. So you end up with a fairly equal like size and you end up with the formants being kind of like, you know, pretty kind of even. So it's like from E, ah is kind of more like here, okay? All right, so the first formant's gonna raise a bit, second formant's gonna come down a bit. You might hear an ah. Ah. And ah, 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 they're fairly small tongue position adjustments, which as a coloratura soprano, ahs in your middle voice are your nemesis, right? Am I right? Because um, everybody's like, it sounds like an uh. If you think you're doing a nice dark, they're like, it sounds like an uh. And then you go, you brighten it. And they're like, now it sounds like ah. Mm, you don't want ah. <sighs> never ending battle for what does the ah, what should the ah be? But yeah, ah is just kind of a funky one because it's just a lot of that opening and all three of those, ah, ah, uh, they're fairly close together. Like the way that the formants look and also the way the tongue is positioned, not super far away from each other. So if somebody's like, you have an uh, it might mean you only need to adjust just the tiniest bit. <laughs> it might just be the little baby adjustment instead of it being like this big thing. You've got to really change. So pro tip there. Um, hey, <laughs> for coloraturas. Um, 
or for sopranos period i guess middle voice is just kind of lower voices love it and like and bigger voices love it but like us more like lyric you know like light lyric folks it's like uh, middle voice no right struggle struggle's real all right and an oo is the other extreme from the e so in an oo vowel your tongue is pulled back a fairly close toward the pharyngeal wall and um, you know so you've constricted space back here so you got this space here and you got a large oral cavity essentially the space in front of that constriction is big ooh and you have a small space right at the lips too so you have kind of that double whammy you got ooh small space small opening here tongue pulled back way back here and what you actually end up having is that first formant is low, just like where the E is. It pretty much stays in the same frequency range, which is why people with hearing loss can, might hear an E as an ooh. What? <laughs> um, yeah. So like, you know, an older person might not hear he, they might think you said you. What do you mean you said you? What? You know, especially if they can't see you at the time. So you have that lower first formant and the second formant, instead of the E, it's way down there. The second form, it comes down and sort of meets up with that lower first because you got like space, space, you know. So um, you might have noticed second form, it tends to move a bit. It moves a little more than first form it does. Um, it's a fairly, you know, fluid little dude. He moves around a lot, second form it. Um, and a lot of people will say second formant relates to oral resonance and first formant relates to pharyngeal resonance. That's sort of the cut and dry, like acoustics 101 way to think about it. So what that actually means is if your first formant is low, um, you're going to have a fair amount of pharyngeal space. Okay. Uh, and second formant will be low if you have a lot of oral space and high if you have not a lot of oral space, which is true. Um, I personally find it gets a little muddy when you think about things like an ooh vowel. <laughs> it starts getting kind of muddy with that. Um, but yeah, essentially your tongue gets pulled back in your mouth. Ooh, maybe not super, super far, but you have a fair amount of air space back there. And then you have, you know, just that small opening. So air space, lots of air space. Nice small opening of your lips for your ooh. Um, okay. So that's our sort of basic like vowel format 101. They are, it's the space of the first and second format relative to each other. And this is something separate really from singer's format. So a lot of times people get a little confused in the singing world. They think of singer's format and vowel resonances being the same thing or being related to each other. That's not really true. But if you have nice clear vowels, right? So like you're doing your pure vowels and your E sounding really good, you probably are singing well enough. You have a loose enough system that if you have the training in there to have that nice singer's formant, that boost from that little epi epiglottis, like a superglottic area, it has that little boost to those super high frequencies because it's a much smaller area there. Um, then it's going to stand out more and people listening to you will be like, oh yeah, it's so good. It sounds so nice and clear because they hear a clear vowel and then they hear a clear vocal quality. Um, so vowels are important, but for it, it all kind of combines in the listener's brain, I think. And I think that's the thing that gets confusing as a singer training and as a voice teacher sometimes too, that, um, what you're really training for is essentially giving that student the best chance of having a listener, an expert listener, hear them sing and go, oh yeah, they've got it all together. They've got the singers format, the vowels sound good. Awesome. Right. Now, for the little linguistics dalliance, here we go. We're going to tiptoe, whoop, dipping a toe in the very shallow end <laughs> of a little bit of linguistics. So what I really want to talk about is stress patterns and languages. Stress patterns have a lot, change the vowel quality a fair amount when people are talking in a lot of different languages. Not all languages, you know, but especially like in, in, in operatic languages, especially in your romantic languages. And let's use Italian as the quintessential one because there's a pretty clear stress pattern to that language that creates a bit of a rhythm, right? It's the da, 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 right? Like, you know, okay, spaghetti, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the like 
super basic way. So we know that they have this stress in the middle of the word usually. Typically, if it's a three-syllable word, it stresses in the middle. And that's the way that goes. Um, and so English is a similar way. American English is similar. Um, where the syllables are stressed has a lot to do with uh, the vowels we produce. So on a stressed syllable, you need a really clear vowel. Like clear, okay? Um, and I think for a lot of American, especially college students, um, learning to sound like a native speaker when you're singing in Italian or French or these other languages, when people say learn the language, learn the language, definitely learn your languages for sure, study them because like I did and now I've lost them completely because I don't use them, so, ah. um, <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, learn them and keep using them, keep practicing, get apps and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> go online and like listen to like you know interviews or whatever in the language because you just lose it after a while um, but yeah so you want to um, mimic the stress patterns of the language just as much as you want to learn how to roll your R's or trill them or flip them or whatever so you have the consonants to deal with sure there's differences in how they produce their consonants but there's also a stress pattern to the language that needs to get in your ear because I think a lot of American singers, especially young students in opera, um, tend to skip that step. They don't think about, uh, they think it's about making it really clear like this, but that's very robotic, the way to talk if you're making equal stress. So a couple years ago, I actually attended a master class um, and there was a young singer there, maybe junior, senior, voice major. She was singing an Italian aria that I know. I actually I knew the text. And her Italian honestly didn't sound very Italian. It sounded kind of funny. And, you know, I, because I knew it, I kind of knew what was going on. But it was interesting to me because the guest uh, person giving the master class, the guest instructor essentially for the master class, um, you know, had her speak through her lines. Okay, let's speak the words. And so when she started speaking the words, in essence, even though it was in Italian, she was speaking like this. It sounded like a robot. <laughs> and then uh, the instructor was like, that's eh, not what I'm really going for. And so he would say the lines and then have her speak them after him. And then after a little bit of back and forth with that, then she went back and sang her lines in the aria. And it was stunningly beautiful and it was a major shift and he made this whole thing about it being about the vowels the pure vowels see how pure those vowels are now they're really pure and what's interesting to me is sitting in the audience as someone with this training from speech language pathology and knowing a bit about linguistic stress patterns now and um, having to listen to it with sort of a more critical ear than I had as a voice teacher and just um, from my music degrees I heard that she had no stress pattern, and then he said it to her like an Italian. It actually sounded like a language and not a robot. And then when she put those stress patterns back in and sort of overlaid them on the singing she was already doing, suddenly it sounded like the language she was trying to do. Hey! So, stress patterns have a big impact on uh, vowels. So if you're a voice major, or you're someone who struggled in diction courses, let's say, and you were like, I can never get it right. What's the exception? And where should the vowel be open? And where should it be closed? I would encourage you to ask, like, yes, go to your references, figure out what it should be. But ask yourself, is it open or closed because of the stress pattern? Is that syllable stressed or unstressed? Hmm, maybe it has more to do with that. And then you can kind of think of it in more of a fluid way, I feel like, and less of like, a, I'm trying to get every vowel right, okay? And if you're still completely unconvinced, here's my best example. You guys know the old joke where it's like you put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, emphasis on the wrong syllable. If I say emphasis, emphasis on the wrong syllable, those are schwas. Schwas, that neutral uh sound in English, is used a lot when a vowel is not stressed. A lot, a lot. And there's secondary stress too, right? So emphasis, it has an i at the end and an m in the beginning and an uh in the middle. So there's kind of a secondary stress pattern there. But 
you still have that really unstressed middle, emphasis, emphasis. It's short, the vowel, the syllable, it does not last very long. It's very short, the mouth doesn't open very much. It just moves through this neutral vowel space onto the next syllable, okay? And a lot of languages have those sort of moments. So if you put, if you do the joke, it's emphasis. I'm making an actual stressed vowel where there shouldn't be one. Emphasis on the wrong syllable. That's to, that's straight up emphasis on the wrong syllable. If you just make an a ah sound in the middle where there should be an a, uh, you've created the wrong stress pattern. And now the words don't sound right. And you know, people might not get the joke if it's, <laughs> if it's not their primary language, they'll be like, I don't get it, what's the deal? So, singers out there, uh, yes, take in all this information about vowel form, it's absolutely super important, clear vowels, pure vowels, when your vowels sound right. If someone says your ah sounds like an uh, might be a slight adjustment, this is just my quick summary. But the real thing too is when you're when you're working on new languages and you're really trying to sound like you know what you're doing, um, really focus on the rhythm of how that language sounds like in that big picture way. You could do that, you could go to YouTube. You could be like, you know, YouTubing up some like, you know, French newscasters, you know, or, or interviews, okay? Um, looking up, you know, Milan versus Naples, like, television broadcasts and see if there's, you know, get to know dialect differences and things like that that way too. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could just do that and get kind of the sound of the language, just kind of internalize it in your ear and get a feel for what that language kind of sounds like. If you were going to dance to the language, does it have a really even rhythm that's easy to dance to or not so much, you know? But then you get a little feel for where this, it becomes a little more inherent that you have this kind of stress pattern that you need to work into your arias. And so when you're doing your speaking through the text, which is always a great way to go to learn it, speak through it. But when you're speaking through it, think, what's the stress pattern here? How would a native speaker say this, right? Don't just focus on making the vowels so pure because going back to that masterclass that I saw, I guarantee you that that student thought she was making her vowels super pure. But what she was actually doing was making it very robotic. Making it very robotic. Instead of putting the stress pattern in there when she sang. So, mouth opens more if you have a stress syllable. Vowel is a lot more clear. Vowel, you know exactly what the vowel should be, nine times out of 10, if it's stressed. <laughs> it's probably not a schwa. Probably not a schwa. It can be a schwa, but it's likely not. Um, you know, in English it might be, like in four, four, but when we sing it we tend to turn. So nine times out of ten as a singer, if a schwa is actually supposed to be stressed, because in language there is such a thing as a stressed schwa, um, we tend to turn it into a vowel. We tend to turn it into like an O or an A ah or something more clear. Um, and that's just the convention. That's the differences between speaking and singing. Um, so yeah. That's my big, like, tip about the vowels. That's our little dalliance in the linguistics territory. Hopefully I didn't step on any linguistics toes because I don't really know that much. Uh, <laughs> nearly as much as people who know it, seriously. If you, if you are a linguistic or, or have known a linguistics major or someone who, like, for reals does linguistics, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? Like, they know stuff about language that I'm like, really? Wow. That's right over my head. All right. Um, so what's up next? I'm not exactly sure. I might do a little something on lips maybe or facial muscles just a little bit, but really facial muscles, I think it's not an area that tends to get super confused. Perhaps I'll do a little bit on mouth opening or embouchure if you want to say, like if you're a singer who does all oh, versus like more neutral looking lip shapes, I guess there could be that. If you have a question about it, let me know. But other than that, this mostly is the physiology here. So I might still do some more quick tips. I'm also considering um, a video on myths of singing, like some of the myths that are really out there and can be somewhat toxic to a young singer. Um, really just trying to debunk some of those myths a bit. And then, um, you know, maybe like how to 
pick a voice teacher. I don't know when that's a good fit. That might be out there. These are just things I'm rolling around in my brain. But if you have any ideas for anything that you want to hear or want to see, or if you have other questions, just let me know, and I'd super be happy to address.